very pleased to be joined on the warning by Justin Elliott of ProPublica, the investigative, nonprofit, journalistic, uh, digital. What what is it? What 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 is the best way to describe ProPublica? It's a the nonprofit investigative news organization. You know, we publish on our website, but then we also uh, are almost all of our stories are uh, under a Creative Commons license. So often, uh, my stories will be republished in in newspapers around the country and. Uh, sometimes with radio and TV as well, but yeah, nonprofit news organization. And and you're not corporately owned. Nope. Five hundred one c three nonprofit. We uh, we disclose our donors. You can look them up on our nine ninety um, foundations, small donors, wealthy people. Right. So it's as transparent as it gets. And there's a concept that undergirds the journalism at ProPublica the public interest, the public good. Can you just talk about that for a concept or as a concept for a minute? When you sit around, you have meetings among the reporters, among the editors at ProPublica, the concept of the public good comes up how? Yeah, I mean, it sort of goes back to our founding. Um, and I, I've been there since 2012, but we started around 2007 and we were founded by uh, Paul Steiger, who had been the managing editor of the Wall Street Journal for many years. Um, and in, you know, in the context of the kind of mid to late aughts, um, that was when the newspaper business model was really starting to be destroyed by the internet. And uh, investigative reporter jobs at newspapers were often the first jobs being cut because uh, people that do this kind of work uh, are not writing stories to put in the paper every day because the work takes time. Um, and so Paul and the other folks that started ProPublica had the idea of, you know, um, essentially having a, a news organization that only had investigative reporters that would do stories that had some kind of uh, accountability angle, um, something in the public interest. So, you know, we're, we don't write, if I pitched a story that's just a really interesting um, profile of somebody, uh, we my editors would, would say no, <laughs> unless there was right. some... Uh, kind of harder edge to it. Somebody doing something wrong, either an institution or a person betraying the public trust in some way. Um, you know, we're, we're totally nonpartisan. Um, I, both I and many of my re colleagues have written about Republicans and Democrats. Uh, actually, my yeah. first story at ProPublica was about a, a Democratic member of Congress, Bill Owens, um, uh, violating the ethics law by uh, taking a, a trip to Taiwan um, that was organized by lobbyists. Uh, he ended up wow. getting censured by the House Ethics Committee. Um, so I've been writing about travel for a while. So so you have two colleagues who, who wrote this story we're going to talk about today, which are the revelations about Justice Samuel Alito, uh, Josh Kaplan, and Alex Meyer-Jeski. Now, is this the same ProPublica team that also uh, reported on Harlan Crow and Clarence Thomas. Yep. It's uh, been the three of us. And um, starting back in December, January, we were sort of poking around on thinking about writing about the judiciary more broadly, actually thinking about writing about the circuit courts, state Supreme courts, but we ended up uh, getting a couple of leads on the travel of Supreme court justices and uh, did not set out to spend the, you know, six or seven months writing about this, but it's uh, really snowballed and starting with the stories about justice Thomas and Harlan Crow. Okay. So um, I think there's a couple of things before we kind of go into the reporting and the, and the facts of this, I just think to table set uh, about this moment in time that, that I think are fairly indisputable. Um, one, uh, the Supreme Court is broken uh, as a as a function of its level of trust and the faith the American people have in it. The Quinnipiac poll came out yesterday. Interestingly, there were a lot of Supreme Court stories out yesterday, um, including yours. Um, Thirty percent of uh, the American people approve of. Uh, the Supreme Court. It's become partisan. It's taken a long time to get there. Um, I played a role in modern Supreme Court history in the Bush White House. Uh, I led the Supreme Court confirmation process for both Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito. 
there's a there's a uh, forgotten piece of history to this, which is that there is a woman named Harriet Myers who was nominated to the Supreme Court. Uh, Harriet Myers was taken down and knocked out in part by opposition from Leonard Leo, who's going to play a role in your story. And then I came back. I had a temporary duty in Iraq. And then I came back and took up the Alito confirmation. And I'll talk about some stories interspersed in this from from throughout that from throughout that process. So so you look at the question of travel, gifts, things that Supreme Court justices are getting that they should disclose or supposed to disclose. But why don't you talk for a minute about how Supreme Court justices are different under judicial ethics? Uh, they have a fairly loose standard that is that is completely built on this is the Supreme Court, trust us. And for a long time, uh, that probably held up with the comportment of the justices. There wasn't this type of this type of behavior. But I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So there's there's sort of a few interesting categories here. So first of all, when it comes to gifts, uh, one thing that's struck us as we've gotten really deep into this is if you talk to your average federal government worker, and you know I have friends that work for uh, various uh, federal agencies, just a you know normal job, not not political appointees, um, they'll tell you that the the rules around taking gifts um, are incredibly strict. I mean, some might even argue they're too strict, but like things like you, if you go to a conference, you can't have somebody at the conference even buy you lunch over like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 30, 40 bucks, something like that. I mean, it, it, there's some variance, but basically like you can't take anything. Um, and even Congress, um, you know, not always known as uh, sort of a paragon of ethics um, actually has fairly strict rules around taking gifts over a relatively low dollar threshold. Um, even when it involves friends, if you're taking significant gifts, like for example, free trips, um, you're not allowed to in many cases, unless you get pre-approval from the ethics committee. Um, when it comes to Supreme Court justices, um, there are very, very few rules about what gifts they can accept. Um, there are some rules uh, if, if there's an actual lawyer at the uh, who's arguing cases at the court, then there are rules about uh, what gifts you can accept. But um, but in terms of, you know, taking gifts from other people, uh, there's very, very few rules. Um, there's uh, the one thing that the law asks and in fact requires of Supreme Court justices is to disclose most gifts that they get. Um, and this is a law that goes back to the 1970s, was passed after Watergate, It's called the Ethics and Government Act. Um, and the kind of short version of it is, um, you know, gifts over four or $500, uh, most gifts over that, that amount, uh, justices have to disclose on their annual filing that comes out every year that's public. Um, so what we've been writing about are these trips taken by Justice Thomas um, and Alito uh, and Scalia, the late Justice Scalia, um, in which they got, you know, free rides on private jets that are, are very, very expensive, free stays at fishing lodges, uh, you know, cruises on super yachts, um, all things that, you know, ethics experts, ethics law experts told us are clearly gifts that are, you know, cost thousands, tens of thousands of dollars in some cases. Um, and they just haven't been disclosing these gifts. Um, and, uh, there's a big dispute now about whether they should have, and, uh, we can get into the weeds on that if you want. <clears throat> let me, let me just like a couple of quick questions for purposes of clarity. Um, as you, as you tell this story, um, uh, Harlan Crow is the man who is the gift giver, uh, to Clarence and Ginny Thomas. Right. Okay. And yeah. Harlan Crow, among other things, has taken them to remote, rem excuse me, to remote corners of the world via private jet, uh, to travel via super yacht. Yeah, all over the world, uh, Indonesia, um, 
you know, uh, undisclosed. the Greek Isles, uh, the Caribbean, Russia. Right. Um, undisclosed. All undisclosed. Yes. For, for you know, well and, over 20 years now. And Harlan, and Harlan Crow has had business before the court. Um, actually, uh, not really. Or, well, not in as direct a way as the story we just wrote about uh, Justice Alito. I mean, Harlan Crow, um, Harlan Crow's business um, itself has not been a litigant at the court. Um, but Harlan Crow is involved as a board member on, on a lot of organizations that regularly file amicus briefs at the court. So not not as direct a connection where it's not like Harlan there's no if you look up, you won't find a case that's like Harlan Crow v some okay. other person. But let yeah. me <laughs> let me Har, Harlan Crow spends a lot of money and a lot of effort, as is his right, like any Americans, to affect the outcome of our political system. Absolutely. And 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 with a specific interest in in fact in the law and the courts, uh, you know, giving to groups like the Federalist Society. Um, so he is, an, a, he is an activist. It is, it is fair to say that Harlan Crow is an activist supporting outcomes from courts. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Sam Lolito, um, let me let me come back to Harlan Crow. He paid the tuition for uh, Clarence Thomas's nephew. Yeah, and and grand nephew, and but but saying grand nephew understates the relationship because right. Justice Thomas um, had taken in his grand nephew. Justice you know, Thomas was a very and Jenny honorable, Thomas raised him, raised him from from the age of I think five or six right. through adulthood, and and so you know had to pay or would have had to pay all of his you know costs, including private school tuition, except that Harlan Grove paid for at least some of it. Right now, a, a member of Congress, right, cannot have somebody. Right. Uh, the president cannot. The defense secretary cannot cannot have, for example, a defense contractor or somebody who has a disruptive technology who wants to sell something to the defense department, pay for their kids tuition. Uh, that's what all the ethics lawyers we spoke to said that clearly okay. uh, that's a gift. <laughs> OK, yeah. And of so a lot of, you is, know, in, in that case, we're talking when we're talking about real money, at least for any ordinary person, we're talking like, I believe, around one hundred thousand dollars in total on, on the tuition. Right. And so this is an amount of money, right? One hundred thousand dollars in tuition is is approximately two hundred thousand dollars after taxes. Right. This is an after tax amount of money. Right. So these are amounts of money and these trips that are adding substantially to the 200 some thousand dollars that a Supreme Court justice makes via income, none of it disclosed, none of it taxed. Right. As, certainly as far as we know on the tax front. Um, yeah, exactly. OK. And 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 the chief justice and we won't go too deep here yet, but his position thus far has been the court is trusted. Don't worry about, don't worry about it. We got this. Supreme Court handle its own ethical issues. Pretty much. I mean, the closest uh, Chief Justice Roberts has come to sort of addressing this head on is in a speech he gave a week or two ago, in uh, in which he made kind of an aside saying that he's sort of aware of the discussion about the court's ethics. And I, th I think the phrase he used was that there is that he is looking at ways to give more, quote, practical effect to their uh, generalized commitment to ethics. Um, not at all clear what that means, if it, if it means anything at all in a concrete way. But, you know, we're watching closely now. Now. Samuel Alito. Um, different set of facts. His relationship is with a hedge fund billionaire named Paul Singer. Right. So Tell the basic, us about Paul Singer. Yeah. So the basic facts here are that um, Paul Singer is a, you know, very wealthy, I think top, uh, top 500 wealthiest people in the country, billionaire, according to Forbes. Um, he is the f founder and head of a hedge fund called Elliott Management um, based in New York, or actually it was based in New York for a long time. I believe they moved to Florida during the pandemic. Um, and what his hedge fund is sort of most famous for, besides be making a, a huge amount of money every year, 
is uh, making investments that require um, complex litigation. Um, so the most famous case was this, you know, 10 plus year fight between Paul Singer's hedge fund and the nation of Argentina. Uh, the very short version is that um, Singer had purchased uh, Argentine government debt for pennies on the dollar around the time Argentina defaulted and then was pursuing them in the U.S. courts for full repayment. And there was um, literally billions of dollars at stake. Uh, and what are the... The brief version of our story is that Paul Singer flew Justice Alito on a private jet to Alaska for a fishing vacation. Um, Justice Alito didn't pay for any of it, didn't disclose any of it, including the private jet ride. And then Paul Singer's hedge fund had a series of cases at the court in which Justice Alito did not recuse himself, including one case that the court actually heard in which Alito uh, voted with the majority for Singer's hedge fund. Okay, I want to I want to stop you right there, and I just sure. want to walk very slowly sure. um, through this for people that are watching, um, most of whom have never had any interaction with an investigative journalist. Um, sure. I am not one of those one of those people um, in in my career. So I want to I want to go through this. So so how did tell me about your initial reach out. Who do you who do you pick up the phone or email? Um, you mean at the beginning of the reporting process or beginning of the reporting process to to Sam Alito's office? And I don't I don't I don't want to be tedious as the, in the details, but 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 this sure. will ladder up to where you know where that that he will he will disclose this himself in an unusual manner. Yeah. So the, you know we've been working on this for months, and I won't go into all the details, but we uh, originally planned to actually publish this. A while ago, but then the the, the, the stories about Clarence Thomas and Harlan Crow mm -hmm. generated a whole series of follow ups, including the you know we got a tip about the tuition, and so we got distracted for a while, and so but we've been looking into this for months and doing a lot of difficult reporting to piece this together. Um, once we got to a place where we thought we're we're close, we think we're close to being able to publish something, um, but we we do what we always do, and we you know ProPublica we refer to this as the kind of no surprises rule, which is uh, anyone who's a significant subject in a story, we do not want them to be surprised by anything in the story. And that's both for ethical reasons of just, we, you know, we genuinely want people to respond and tell us if we have things wrong or if they disagree with some conclusion. Um, uh, and also, you know, we don't want to be in a situation where somebody is coming out after a story is published saying you got things wrong. You didn't tell me you were going to put this in. Um, so we, um, the way it works with the Supreme court is uh, each justice does not have their own press office in a way that a member of Congress would, or a political campaign would. Um, they all share the same press office, the, the Supreme court press office. Um, so we um, uh, called them and emailed them uh, a long list of questions that included um, a preamble saying, you know, we would uh, welcome the opportunity to to do an interview on the phone or in person with Justice Alito. Um, and here, if you want to sort of engage in writing instead, here's a long list of questions. I can't remember how many, but covering everything that we were at least considering putting in the story. Um, and, you know, at, th at that point, the story is not fully written yet, but we're kind of moving in that direction. Um, okay, and, so yeah. so just real real quick. So that person, right? Same person. If it's Justice Sotomayor, if it's Justice Kagan, if it's uh, Justice Alito, if it's Justice Thomas, same person, same same group of people. Exactly. Yep. Okay. So so what happens next? Do they do they do they? Is there a difference in the response between Thomas and Alito from the same group of people? You know, it's a very good question. What I mean, I can tell you what happens next from our perspective. What happens next at the court um, is uh, a very interesting question. And and how that all works is very opaque. <laughs> um, so how much the Supreme Court press office, which has, you know, a handful of uh, employees who work for the court, um, how much they are in the driver's seat versus the justice or the justice's chambers? Um, you know, where they have their clerks and their own assistants, 
Um, and, and what those interactions look like between the press office and the justices chambers are uh, is is totally opaque. And, and I wish I knew more about how that worked, because, again, normally when you're dealing with, let's say, a senator, um, the senator's press office works for the senator. <laughs> Um, right. And so there's no there's no potential divergence of interests or question about how it's working. It's all one unit. So is there um, a divergence in tactics in in approach between your inquiries around Thomas and your interrogatories around Alito? Not really. For us, it's about, again, like a, a totally good faith. Uh, right. attempt to get some kind of substantive good. engagement. Obviously, we'd love to have an interview. And if we don't get that, we'll, we're happy to like take right. answers and, and write there's no di- there's no difference in the response from the court side, from the PR office. Rep- that's what I'm asking. Between, um, between Alito and Thomas, that's material where you're like, wow, right? You're playing this set of questions very, very d- differently from, from that set of questions unique to the two personalities that might be suggestive that it's the justice who is directing the the, the response that's um, being executed as opposed to the way it would work with a political staffer in defense of the senator, right? There's a broad remit to defend, right? To explicate, to question motives, and to hold a line as a job, which I don't get necessarily that that's the job of these people. So in my experience with the Supreme Court press office, which again, has only been the last six or seven months, um, I've gotten very little engagement. Um, Sometimes if you call, you know, a spokesperson for a senator, they might, uh, you know, yeah, kind of argue with you or engage with you and or have a conversation with you, which is good. Um, (laughs) uh, With the Supreme Court press office, I mean, with the questions for Justice Thomas, I mean, we just never got any response, period. Um, okay. And, you know, I think I called them up a bunch of times just to make sure they'd gotten the questions because it was like, uh, you know, um, I wasn't even getting an acknowledgement of receipt. Um, Justice Thomas has put out one statement uh, that he actually released after our first story about his travels with Harlan Crow, like a very brief statement, um, which we, you know, which we published, of course. Um in terms of the response on this story about Justice Alito, so what happened was we reached out to them last week, uh, these detailed questions. Um, we uh, the deadline the the deadline was Tuesday, although we told them what we sort of always say, which is if you feel like you need more time and and you're going to work on substantive responses, we're we're like very willing to negotiate an extension of our deadline. Um, and we had a phone call, you know, on the record on Tuesday, I believe around noon with the chief spokeswoman for the Supreme Court who just told us um, Justice Alito is not going to be responding to your questions. Um, and then the other thing about that interaction, and I, I honestly don't know how much to read into this, uh, is the spokeswoman asked us, um, when will you be running your story? And that's a question that, you know, usually we're pretty happy to be transparent about. And we told we told her um, this was Tuesday midday. uh, Well, we don't have an exact date yet, but it could be as early as tomorrow. Wednesday might be Thursday. um, But, uh, you know, and she said, but it's definitely not going to be today, Tuesday. And we said, that's right. It's not going to be today, Tuesday. Um, And then about about five hours after that phone call, I was on Twitter and saw that the Wall Street Journal had published a op-ed from Justice Alito uh, responding to our questions um, and sort of attacking us. Okay. Has that ever happened to you before in a, in a story that, never... that you've, that you've, <laughs> that you've run and we'll, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the tactic there for a minute yeah. in a second, but. It's never happened to me quite like that. I've, I've had people create websites responding to a story after it's published to kind of lay out their, uh, their views, which, yeah, as you know, is totally their right, of course, but has never happened to me that I've gotten a, a, a pre buttle published somewhere else. And also the headline of which, and I don't know if Justice Alito wrote the headline, said, pro, I, I believe the headline is ProPublica misleads its readers. And we hadn't even published the story at that point. So that's kind of a strange. Right. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to set the table here because we have a lot of things going on in the culture and politically 
in this moment right now that are that are pretty remarkable. So just as a tactic, and you know, I think a lot of people watching know that I spent uh, about a decade as the vice chairman of the biggest public relations firm in the world, but you know, experience in the communications and the combat of American politics at the at the highest level. And what you're talking about here really is a nuclear option for a subject of a story that isn't looking for a transactional relationship, isn't isn't looking to move on, isn't looking at this through the prism of, well, this is part of the incoming that comes along with the office or job, right? This is the nuclear strategy. This is the existential response and what, and what the tactic is, right? The parlance is this is you're scooping the story. So, so the most classic way to do this is let's say the New York Times is working on some investigative piece, a lot of credibility, and the subject takes the information, packages it, leaks it themselves to a paper, let's say, that has no credibility, what like the Washington Examiner. The Washington Examiner runs it, and now the New York Times says, well, we risk our integrity and reputation running an old story published here no matter how long, how hard, how much investigation has been has been done. So, so what Alito did is get out ahead of the story by going to the Wall Street Journal, which is, of course, owned by News Corp, which owns Fox News, which just had to write a check for nearly a billion dollars for lying. And the lying cascades nonstop, all night, every night regardless of whether Tucker Carlson is out, Alito, a Supreme Court justice, uses this very harsh, hardball PR tactic, goes to the Murdoch empire and gets published in the Wall Street Journal a story that says what this is really about is ProPublica's lying about Alito. Do I do I have that right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, anything I, I said there of, incorrect? Well, you know, I, I think it's a slight variation. I no, I, I think that's basically I think the thrust of that's right. I think it's a slight variation on the like going to the rival publication, because in this case, he actually published a column under his own name. Right. Uh, you know, we sometimes have a freight, you know, like the the strategy of going for the going to the rival publication. I, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but we sometimes call that like you know, spitting in our soup, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, our, um, <laughs> but this wasn't, this was a sort of twist on that. And like, look, I'll, I will defend, I mean, in, uh, I guess defend's not really the right verb because I'm not, I don't think you're- He doesn't owe you anything, him. I don't think. He can do whatever I, he wants, Exactly. Right? He has every, he has every right to publish this. And um, I don't think, I don't think the Wall Street Journal editorial page and, and you know, as, as many people listening probably know is a completely separate entity from the Wall Street Journal news pages that, you know, em employs a lot of responsible reporters. I, the one thing I take issue with is putting a headline. Uh, and again, I don't know if Justice Alito wrote the headline um, or who wrote the headline, but it is, um, I strongly object to the headline, ProPublica misleads its readers about a story that has not been published. And part of the reason, one of the main reasons we're going to him for comment is so he can tell us uh x y z word for that x y z fact is wrong uh and and if we yeah. get convinced and this happens all the time like sometimes we have things there's, wrong there's and we'll there, we'll change the story yeah there's a word for that for that <laughs> headline do you know what the word is i'll let you uh i'll let you it's label or, it it's orwellian is what it is it's orwellian right i mean it's <laughs> there's some sort of there's something going on. I don't know if it's like time travel, uh, some sort of multi multidimensional dynamic. Do you have any sense from reporting in the court that anybody who's on the bench reads about this escapade and just loses their shit, completely loses it as a member of the institution from the laxity of standards and the disregard for the reputation of the court? You no, know, 
I don't know. I think we've seen a little bit. And by, you know, I wish I was more uh, plugged in at the court. And if, if anyone out there is plugged in, please get in touch. Um, I mean, we've seen a little uh, sort of schism open up in the last few weeks and um, what, or, or what appears to be a little schism, which is Justice Kagan, um, I think a couple times now, has put out uh, statements when she has recused herself from cases. And traditionally, the justices, uh, when they when they recuse themselves, there's just a little notation on the docket that says Justice Alito has recused himself or Justice Kagan has recused herself and doesn't tell you why. Um, we've now seen a couple times in recent weeks Justice Kagan changing her practices on that. And it says uh, it'll give you a little bit of detail about why she's recusing herself. herself. So say Justice Kagan recused herself. Um, and then it cites part of the recusal law that, um, you know, that allows you to kind of figure out why she's recusing herself. And uh, Justice Alito, for example, has not been doing that. And so that seems to be, or at least, you know, there's been some observers of the court who believe that that's, um, th there's beginning to be a, a kind of divergence in practices there. Um, but it, no, I mean, to, to answer your question directly, um, I don't know what the reaction has been inside the court. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly opaque institution. So, so let's get to the let's get to the facts and the story that that Alito is is disputing, right? And so, so first, right, um, the seat on the airplane, right? This is how much does a Supreme Court justice make a year? I think I believe now it's around three hundred thousand. Okay, and and the airplane costs how much to charter? the the whole thing we we understand like well over a hundred thousand in this case because this is a okay. long flight one way one way this is a long flight and, from the east coast to um you know alaska and it's one of the remote most remote parts of the country is a salmon fishing lodge exactly and that lodge is owned by rob arkley who's a um california owns a california uh, mortgage business Okay. Company. He was in the subprime mortgage business, I think. Yeah. Sub subprime and purchasing distress mortgages and then uh, servicing them and trading them and uh, doing some other real estate development as well. But yeah, subprime well, distress mortgages. I have a, I have a, I have an interaction with Robin Arkley through my years working for governor Schwarzenegger after his reelection, he was governor Um I was involved in a project that Robin Arkley was involved in. And um, I was very, very clear always with any clients that I just didn't lobby the governor's office. Um, I wouldn't do anything for you with the governor's office. I wouldn't interfere, intercede in any way. I didn't think it was appropriate. And Robin Arkley became the first person uh, to demand uh, in, of me a quid pro quo. Uh, he demanded a seat on the Coastal Commission in California saying he bought it in the election. And the result of that was I fired him as a client. I called the chief of staff to the governor and I said he can never meet with the with the governor, cancel it. And, and that was that and make whatever decision you need to make to uh, refer this to the general counsel if it needs to go to the attorney general's office, um, which is, you know, in my view, the appropriate way. But but this character um, is I describe him over the years as a figure like the evil boss from the Patrick Swayze movie Roadhouse. Right. He's the boss and the bully of this small town, Eureka, California. Um, in Humboldt County, uh, once famous as the weed capital of California, but Robin Arkley bought the newspaper, um, was vociferous in town affairs, had a reputation for bullying, for reprisals, for throwing, throwing the money around, um, and really a figure with deep, deep, deep connections to the far right, uh, with a woman who's worked for him for a long time named Ann Corkery, 
who became very involved with Sarah Palin in that wing of the Republican Party, as well as with Ginny Thomas, as well as with Leonard Leo, who's also involved. And Leonard Leo is the head of the Federalist Society and is the architect of Donald Trump's Supreme Court nominations and has grown in stature and influence as such and has just received a $1,600,000,000 donation to continue his work. Yeah, right. So yeah, I mean, the, the it's a really interesting cast of characters here. And like, I, before this reporting, I had not heard of Arkley. Uh, I th- my understanding is he lost a lot of money in the financial crisis, given that he, was, it, yeah. he was in the mortgage business. But back in the mid 2000s, yeah, as you said, he was, he, he, he'd been sort of a fixture in Eureka, California politics. And, you know, I think there was a incident where he was alleged to have like, physically gotten into a shoving match with a city councilman over like development projects, like local stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, but then he made a fortune um, in the mortgage business and he had private jets and suddenly he became a, a significant uh, national political donor, um, including to um, group, groups affiliated with, with Leonard Leo of the Federalist Society. And Parkley seems to have taken a particular interest in um, the courts. He's an attorney himself originally, uh, not practicing. Um, and, you know, our, one of the things, so he ended up uh, acquiring this fishing lodge. Uh, it's called King Salmon Lodge. He doesn't own it anymore. Um, and this was a, a luxury fishing lodge, uh, cost more than $1,000 a night. They have a whole fleet of bush planes and um, private chefs, and you go there and it, People like Larry Sanka, Dan Rather, celebrities go have gone there in the Arkley years, and um, you know you have a great time fishing for for king salmon and kind of uh, eating well, drinking well. Um, and one of the kind of stunning things that we learned in our story, and we still don't really have the full story of how this happened, is that um, th- this kind of random businessman in Eureka, California, uh, seems to have developed personal relationships with with one third of the sitting justices of the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. Uh, Justice um, Alito, who he hosted for free at his fishing lodge. Justice Scalia, who we also gave a uh, free fishing vacation to in Alaska. Um, and we were also told by people that know Arkley that he used to brag that he had a relationship with Justice Thomas as well. So I think one of the big picture themes that's interesting to us here that we're still trying to kind of untangle is um these kind of random seeming uh, wealthy businessmen slash political donors um, are getting access to the most powerful judges in the country, at least in some cases by sort of paying for their vacations, <laughs> which is an well, interesting you, you dynamic. Got, you know, it's yeah. like it's like looking out on the ocean. We'll use the Alaska analogy and looking for that whale spout, right? Looking for that spray. So what you see through Arkley is the dark money surfacing. He has these connections, right? Um, Like a whole constellation of people to Leonard Leo, right? Who is the steward of the relationships. And none of this is transparent with the American people. All of it is deeply, deeply, deeply corrupting. Um, you know, I had this experience with with Alito running the confirmation that I that I haven't shared, but people on the team know it. There was a issue, a recusal issue uh, that was being investigated by the Senate Democrats. Uh, we did not evaluate it as being particularly significant or, or meritorious at a at a substantive level. Uh, What Alito did was call up a friend of his, Judge Becker, who was a senior retired judge, if I remember correctly, from the Third Circuit, who was best friends with Arlen Specter. So I get a call to come down from the White House to meet with Specter. And we meet with Specter and, and Specter's type guy. And he basically says, I got this call from Judge Becker who got a call from Alito, who said that Alito wants this recusal issue fully investigated. Now, I got to do it. 
Now, this was very upsetting, right? Because I'm the person who's running the Supreme Court nomination. And basically, Supreme Court 101, if you want to stop a Supreme Court confirmation, it's a lot like hijacking or robbing a train, right? <laughs> the first thing you have to do if you want to rob the train is derail the train, right? You have to stop the train, right? You have to halt the momentum of the confirmation hearing. So this was our first delay. So I go and I have this conversation with Alito and I was completely furious with him. And I and I said to him, uh, Judge, so do you remember when the when the president asked you to be to be on the Supreme Court? And he and he and he goes, yeah, he goes, yeah, I, I, I go, who was there? And he goes, you know, I think the vice president was there. Carl Rove was there, my wife, whatever. And I go, was I there? And he goes, he goes, no, you weren't you weren't there. And I go, I go, do you remember the moment when 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 I got asked to make sure you get nominated to be the Supreme Court justice? And he was like, no, no, I wasn't there. I was like, do you understand how this works? <laughs> do you understand how this works? Right. Don't do that again. Don't do okay. that again. You're not a Supreme Court justice again. But he was petulant. He was angry and constantly affronted by the process. Uh, he was a he was very, very, very difficult as a personality through that through that crisis. And I think that one of the one of the features of the Supreme Court, and I think there's this brilliant piece written in The New Yorker, the Intelligencer column, um, and I'm, I'm completely blanking on the on the author's name, but she's just a brilliant, 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 incandescently brilliant writer. Um, who writes this story about Clarence and Ginny Thomas. And Harry it's, Howley, it's, yeah, Harry yeah, Howley, great writer. Just yeah, great, great writer. And she gets to the last two paragraphs of it. And, and basically, you know, I think it explains so much is you, you have in Alito and you have in Thomas and you have in Kavanaugh, three really angry, aggrieved guys through their confirmation process. Um, that have lifetime appointments and they are. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, re the whole recusal thing I and mean, without getting into the weeds of it too much is, but it's really interesting in the context of, of our story, because again, Paul Singer, the hedge fund guy who uh, flew justice Alito out to Alaska on a private jet, he then had all these cases and Alito didn't recuse himself. And the episode I believe you're referring to during his confirmation was, uh, Senate Democrats or some of them were going on the Judiciary Committee were going after him about uh, an issue that as a reporter, like I, reading back through it, I did not find convincing at all. It seemed like a total uh, nothing, basically, or not nothing, but very minor issue involving some Vanguard mutual funds that he owned and uh, a case involving Vanguard where I don't think any person would van owns a vanguard mutual fund is going to be in the tank for vanguard uh so it did not seem significant to me right. at all but what what did seem significant though is that it um that whole episode produced some paperwork and some comments from then judge alito about his recusal practices including a letter that we published republished that he wrote to arlen specter in which he described his recusal practices and he said you know, I take this so seriously. I, I go even beyond the, what the law requires. And my practice is to recuse myself when, quote, any possible question arises. Um, and we asked him about this last week. You know, we said, is this still your practice? And he didn't respond to that in his Wall Street Journal op-ed. But, you know, all of the, you know, we talked to all these judicial recusal experts who said, like, look, if you're getting something of significant value from a party in a case like a private jet flight, Clearly, there's some kind of question that's going to arise there. I mean, even as some one of them put it to us, look, if I was suing you in court and I learned uh, that you had just flown the, the judge to a fishing vacation, there's pictures of you fishing together. How would I feel about that? Like, not good <laughs> about the judge's fairness. Um, so I don't know if he still has that standard for recusals or if uh, it's changed now that he's on the court or what, but. Well, it doesn't measure up by the activity, right? It doesn't. No, it does not seem to. Is there is there been any follow on reaction 
um, to this story that you find surprising? I mean, surprise, it takes a lot to surprise me these days. Um, I think that uh, we've been a little bit um, disappointed that the reaction has been so partisan because it doesn't seem like it should be a partisan issue. Uh, at least the questions around disclosure of gifts and recusal once you've gotten a significant gift from somebody. And, you know, we've only written about when we've been criticized for only writing about Justice Thomas and Justice Alito, who are obviously both appointed by Republicans. And what I keep saying is uh, I've only been covering the Supreme Court for six months and these stories take time. And if anyone has information about justices appointed, appointed by Democrats, uh, please get in touch because it doesn't it, I don't think this should be a partisan thing. Um, it seems like well, everyone I, would. It, it seems a, like it everyone is. would benefit. It seems like everyone would benefit in terms of even even including the institution. Um, I have an of, opinion. Yeah. yeah, I have an opinion about this. Right. But it but it does beg the question. Right. Which is, is it these two guys that are doing this or is it all nine of them? That are doing it, this. It's a very good question. I And I don't think we uh I, I don't think we can conclusively answer at this point because it's taken a lot of uh, hard reporting to bring these yeah. things to light. So I'm gonna, it's, a, it's a good question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to suspect um, that, that the answer will be um, a partisan answer, um, unfortunately. But 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 we'll see like through the reporting. But it's possible. We, but, no, it's certainly we, possible. Yeah. But what we do know, like indisputably is is that you have Supreme Court justices um, who are playing hardball PR, um, assailing the integrity of fact matters in the court of public opinion around recusal issues uh, that they were crystal clear about uh, as they were about their commitments to story decisis and precedent during their confirmation hearings um, that would seem to contradict uh, very fundamentally every core tenet of judicial ethics, as, as most ethicists understand them, I think is the plain meaning of your story. Yeah, I mean, certainly the recusal experts, you know, people that study judicial, they, the, the term they use for it is disc, the, the disqualification statute. Um, that was their view. I mean, what the actual law said, I mean, this is another interesting thing about the court. If if a lower court federal judge uh, doesn't recuse himself and there's a party himself or herself and there's a party who's upset about that, um, they have recourse. They can appeal the decision um, with the Supreme Court, you know, for better or worse. Uh, the setup is that each individual justice um decides completely for themselves whether to recuse. The full court, the chief justice, the full court has nothing to say about it. Um, and uh, there's, you know, there's been some bills introduced that would change that. And there's, there's the Supre Chief Justice Roberts has made some public statements that suggest the Supreme Court would resist that and suggesting, some people argue that Congress doesn't even have the power under the constitution to impose rules on the court. Um, so, uh, you know, the, um, I can't remember. I can't remember what the question was, but yes, uh, you know, many of the judicial recusal experts we spoke to said that this was not a close call. And it, the thing that was most convincing to me was just like think about if you were in a lawsuit yourself and you found out the person on the other side uh, was jetting the judge around on private jets and going on vacation with them. How would you feel? It doesn't seem like a tough call. That well, I, I, I wouldn't I, feel. I wouldn't feel good about it. No. No, no, not not at all. Um, I think that you and your your colleagues have written some remarkable stories. Um, we talk a lot about uh, this podcast and on the warning platform about the collapse of trust, about the crises that spreads across our politics, our uh, businesses, including the media business. Uh, but this is what journalism is and should be and is necessary, um, which is to expose public officials doing things 
uh, that they should not be doing. And, and there's no question whatsoever. Um, and I'll, I'll say this, you know, with regard to the, to the confirmation, if you had sat around in the confirmation prep rooms uh, with Sam Alito in 2005 and said, I'm going to ask you a hypothetical, how would you respond to this situation, judge, right? Pretending that it's 20 years hence and you're now on the Supreme Court, what say you? Right. And his answer would have been very different uh, and not something I suspect, but that I know for certain uh, than the drivel that he wrote in the Wall Street Journal, um, which was, as I said, Orwellian, um, because, in fact, uh, ProPublica reported facts about several billionaires, uh, massive political donors people with frequent business and issues before the court, whether they be commercial or ideological, who are establishing deep, deep relationships with these Supreme Court justices that are secret, uh, that are in the shadows, uh, that are at the world's most exclusive places uh, where you arrive in the most exclusive style imaginable. And, and, and the American people uh, who these people work for have a right to know this. So I, I, I applaud you um, for, the, for the excellence of the, of the journalism and the service you've done in illuminating uh, what I think is an act of corruption on the United States Supreme Court that needs to be addressed very, very urgently and very seriously. Well, I really appreciate it. And again, we uh, there's a whole team of three of us on this stuff. So if anyone has anything we should be poking around on, please get in touch. Yeah, and again, it's Josh Kaplan, Alex Meyer Jeske, uh, three of the ProPublica reporters who wrote these astounding, astounding series of articles about the United States Supreme Court and the, and the scandals uh, of gifts and lavish gifts at that. Uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so you never miss a video. Also, for more content just like this, please consider joining our warning premium community. You can find out more in the description below.